Oh, thanks everyone. Uh, it too is my first time presenting live since since the pandemic started. I think that's true for most everyone in the room here. So uh, keep that in mind as you're watching all the speakers today. Uh, we may all be a little off our game, a little nervous, uh, but we're all super excited to be back. Uh, and thank you for being here bright and early to see me drop some cool stuff here. This presentation is very, uh, I like to call it very nutrient dense. There's a lot of information in here. It's like a two hour presentation that I try to cram down into like 45 minutes to an hour. So I'm gonna talk really, really fast and that's why. Um, I do have my slides up for this at the link that you can see on the screen there. So you can go and download those. I really recommend doing that because a lot of these slides are gonna have a ton of information on them. So you can either take some screenshots if you got your screenshots ready or go grab the slide deck from there and you can use it uh, that way because uh, it's really gonna help you in the field going forward. I'm gonna teach you so much stuff today that's gonna let you go to work uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, is it, what day is it? Is it Thursday today? Is it Wednesday? Anyone know? Does anyone know what day it is ever anymore? Okay, uh, maybe don't do so much work tomorrow, but maybe, maybe like Monday you could start implementing some of this. Some of this. Uh, I'm Johnny Christmas. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I've done a ton and you can just duck, duck, go me and see what I've done. <laughs> um, I do work for uh, Grimm right now. Grimm is an awesome security engineering company. We also offer uh, assessments. We offer training. We have the full package here. We, uh, I am a big fan of Greylog and I use Greylog at Grimm to develop training around. It's always really cool to have uh, a, an organization that you're a fan of invite you to come and do something for them. So I really want to give it up for Greylog for asking me to come here. When I saw that come in, I was like, oh, that's, wow, Greylog, that's really cool. So I'm a big fan of Greylog. Um, we use it at Grimm. Uh, so if you need any, if you are looking for the best, most smartest security individuals in the US to come in and do something to solve your hardest security problems. That's what we do at Grimm. Um, we don't take on easy projects. We don't take on the simple stuff. Uh, we're there for when you've already brought somebody in and they couldn't do it for you. We come in and get it done. That's our specialty. So uh, if you need assessments, if you need engineering, we actually do the engineering. So uh, it's real common for us to do an assessment uh, and say, hey, there's a lot of problems in your code. Here's how you should fix it. Also, if you would like us to recode this for you, we can absolutely do, absolutely do this for you as well. Uh, we're one of the very few security assessment companies out there that are also offering engineering services. We also offer training in most anything security related, both on the IT and the OT side. Uh, I specialize on the OT side. I am a trainer there and a researcher, as you can see, uh, but I'm not gonna linger on this anymore. There's a few links there that you can check out uh, if you're interested in us uh, and me. Uh, that aside, I've done, as you can see, uh, pretty much every job there is to do in security, and that's all that really matters here. Uh, so uh, I am and also used to be and I am on occasion, depending on where I'm working, what I'm doing, a pen tester. Um, I got sick of being a pen tester after a fashion and took a long break from it because uh, you guys made it really boring. <laughs> um, I found myself using the same TTPs in every engagement that I would go on. Uh, and when you're doing the same thing day in, day out, owning a company day in and day out, having to find the trillionth way to rewrite the exact same report for a different company, you get really sick of doing that. And like my job was, uh, I focused on, on financial, uh, and then when I moved into OT, I focused on rail, you know, trains. So my job was literally to rob banks and to rob trains. Like when you're seven years old, that's, that's the coolest thing you can think of. You know, like, what do you want to do when you're seven? Oh, you see bank robbers on TV and we glorify these people. And like, it, you know, depending on how old you are, it, the, the old Westerns on TV, like you couldn't watch a Western without a train robbery going on. This was my job. And here I am going, man, I can't stand this anymore. Uh, and it's because it was so repetitive and so easy. And so I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put together some talks where I just drop all of the TTPs that I use. I'm going to drop the attack chain that I constantly use at every organization so that everyone out there who has to defend against me can fix all of these things proactively so that when pen testers come in, it's not easy. It's not boring. Uh, that's really good for the pen tester because they like doing it. It's really good for you because it means you're going to get your money's worth when you bring in a pen tester instead of calling them you know, spending $250,000 on them and having them just do the same crap they do everywhere. 
Um, fix this stuff first, then call in your pen tester. Uh, so that being said, this talk is going to be both sides of things. It's going to be uh, a brief discussion on the tools that are used uh, as a pen tester and what they do and what they're exploiting, and then some brief discussion on what you can do to defend against those types of attacks in the real world. Um, this attack chain that I'm going to be talking about here is uh, not going to apply to every company out there. The bigger your company it is, the more susceptible you're going to be to more of the attacks in here. Um, and that means that regardless of who you are, there's going to be at least one, probably three things in here that are going to be devastatingly effective in your environment. So even if you go, ah, oh, this won't work against me because we protect against thing number one and we're done. Make sure that you're protecting against thing number seven because that's how defense in depth works. Anytime an attacker can inject themselves anywhere in this attack chain and start from there, you need to make sure that you're defended against it. So yep, that's, that's gonna be the big thing here. I'm gonna teach you how we're doing it. You're gonna go back on, let's say Monday, <laughs> and start implementing some of these things. And a lot of these fixes that I'm gonna recommend are free. They don't recommend contacting any vendor. They don't recommend spending any more money. They, they, they just involve configuring things the right way. So the methodology that many of us use as pen testers is this. It's the Penetration Testing Execution Standard. It was created by folks like Nick Percoco, Chris Nickerson, Dave Kennedy, huge names in the, in the penetration testing in the security industry for reasons because they, they invent things like this. This was created to make sure that penetration testing follows uh, a very thorough framework and that everything is done properly every step of the way. And it's a really cool framework because it, 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 it really does cover how we perform penetration testing. I'm gonna walk you through it just so you understand how this, attack, this entire attack chain works. Um, we start off with intelligence gathering. And this is literally, so you know, I call this talk couch to compromise. This is us starting from our couch. This is a laptop and the internet. This intelligence gather, gathering starts with lots of open source intelligence to find out what a company's footprint looks like on the internet. We're trying to find out uh, who's in charge there. What is their IP space? What other domains do they own? What, uh, what are the email addresses of some important people there? Anything we can gather that might be useful later. Sometimes we know where it'll be useful. Sometimes we don't know, but it's interesting. And we take notes and we write it down and we move forward. Eventually, we gather enough to figure out, okay, here is a situation I can exploit. We move into this exploitation phase. This phase... Um, when, usually when I say exploitation, especially to defenders, they think like, oh, we're exploiting a vulnerability. We, we, found, we ran a vuln scanner, and we found that they're susceptible to this vuln, and so we're going to run this, and then we're going to shell in a server. That's almost never the case. It is super rare as a penetration tester that a vulnerability drops that is that useful. Um, most of the time, they're not. And so this exploitation is almost always an exploitation of... Uh, poor configurations or something that just isn't set up right. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But once we've exploited, once we've gotten in, once we've landed a shell or we've landed on a computer inside the organization, we move into this post-exploitation, uh, which is what's on this computer? Um, is, there, is, is this already what I need? Um, is, is there anything that I can grab from this place to exfiltrate. You do all of your local, like, all right, I'm in, let's grab everything there is and run from where I am. Uh, but then often, that's not the end. Usually that computer you land on is not gonna give you the keys, the keys to the kingdom. And so you gotta keep moving. And so once you're in there, you move back to uh, that intelligence gathering phase. I should set this to like, <laughs> rotate back and I didn't. But yeah, you can see from the circle there, it moves into that intelligence gathering phase again. And we start all over. We see what is there to see from this new computer that I'm on. Can I gather information from the inbox of the user that this computer belongs to? Is that information going to tell me more about the IT landscape that's going to be helpful? Probably. Is it going to have passwords that somebody emailed because they're going out of town for a month and like, here's the password for this and this and go ahead and just, you know, keep an eye on things while I'm gone. Absolutely. It's totally going to have those things in there because it always does. This this, does this computer have a, a text file on the desktop where somebody has temporarily stored a bunch of password, passwords because they're going to put them in the password store later, but right now they're still in the middle of figuring stuff out and this is the easiest place to put them? Yeah, that's going to be there. I find that all the time. <laughs> um, that aside, uh, like I said, attackers rarely exploit, exploit known vulnerabilities, like known 
uh, things that generally get patched inside of software. And also, we rarely burn O days against vulnerabilities that we personally know of, but maybe the general public has or the vendor hasn't been made aware of yet. Because uh, those are super, super, super valuable. And generally, if you burn an O day, whoever you burned it against, we call it burning because whenever you use it, there's a great chance that it's going to be discovered either by the person you used against or the vendor, and they're going to look into that, and then it'll be patched, and its efficacy is greatly reduced at that point. Um, that's a last resort. Usually, like I said, we're exploiting bad configurations. We're exploiting the fact that every company out there has overworked IT professionals, overworked systems administrators, people who uh, th it's all they can do to get things working and then they have to go on to get something else working, and they go, all right, there's a lot of extra work, a lot of back burner work on this. It's, you know, it's not best practices. Security really says we should do this and this. We don't have the time right now because this other project is way bigger, and we need to get this online. We need to get this moving. And the other stuff just gets left there. And the next thing you know, six, eight months, 12 months, two years goes by, and you have a lot of insecure configurations all over the place in this environment that... Uh, have been forgotten about. That's usually what we're exploiting as penetration testers. Um, we're also not uh, generally importing malware and hacking tools and running them directly on the systems that are in there. Usually what we're doing is we're trying to get a shell on a system that we can use as a proxy for all the tools that we're running on our end. So your EDR is often not very effective against what we're trying to do here because there's nothing for it to catch because uh, the system that the EDR is running on is, is often just, it's that proxy. It's just running instructions that we're handing to it. And that's only if we have to run tools. Oftentimes, we try to use the operating system itself to do a lot of our work. And you'll see there's some tools that will leverage that more heavily. Uh, but um, if I can get a PowerShell window open, uh, that's great. I can do a ton with just PowerShell directly in there. You'll see a lot of the stuff I'm doing is just... Uh, a lot of domain and active directory related, related things that computers are just allowed to do. Um, we, we live off the land. Uh, tools and malware, that's an absolute last resort because we know that's going to set off a ton, of, a ton of alerts. So let's start off uh, with, with the recon phase. And I'm going to be drinking a lot of water because this desert air is destroying me. So if you're like, wow, that guy drinks a lot of water, it's not true at all. I'm just dead. It's, <laughs> I've been here a day, and I'm, man, I feel like a husk. <clears throat> That's also why I'm talking funny. Uh, so let's move into the recon phase. Let's see what we can find out about Company X that we're trying to hack today. First place I, look to, I like to look is Aaron. If you're not familiar with Aaron, this is the American Registry for Internet Numbers. I'm pretty sure I got that right. And uh, this is the organization, at least in the US, that companies use when they want to buy a huge block of, of public IPs to use for the organization. So if you're dealing with somebody who does a lot of e-commerce or something like that, this is super important. They're going to have a lot of internet-facing things. You need to know where to look for those internet-facing things. You can't scan the entirety of the internet looking for one company's stuff because you'll often never know if you know, it actually belongs to that company unless they do a really good job with their banners, which they never do. Uh, and so I like to use Aaron and, and literally just look up a company uh, and say, all right, cool, who's, you know, what, what does their IP space look like? I, I literally, my target company I use here is literally Target, the Target Corporation. <laughs> Great name for when you're trying to do demo stuff. And I look up and I go, oh, cool, they have a huge slash 16 here. So generally, like, what you can do is if you look up target.com, you're going to get one IP address. You might get three IP addresses depending on how their load balancing is set up, and that's it. But, you know, we can see from here, target.com has, has a whole slash 16. Now, of course, they're not, they're probably not leveraging every last IP address in there, but there's a lot of IP addresses in there, and we have to check all those. This has is, this is greatly widened our scope from, like, oh, the three IP, IP addresses the website, you know, returns with. Um, we can also see from here, um, we've got email addresses for whoever registered these IP addresses. Um, a lot of companies still don't obfuscate these. Um, a lot of companies require this to be here. Um, generally, whoever... Own, whoever this email address belongs to is a super duper important person inside of the organization because they're often, you know, they often have uh, uh, signing ability, which means they're usually like a VP or something higher like that, often a CISO. So great email address to steal right off the gate uh, to use for um, phishing and things like that. <clears throat> so now that we've got this huge, huge range of uh, IP addresses that we need to hit, um, what are we going to do? You know, we got to scan all those. Look what's running on them. 
Uh, and you know everybody knows the tool Nmap. Everyone's used Nmap forever. Penetration testers still use Nmap for sure. There's there's pretty much nothing better for this specific task than Nmap, except that Nmap is extremely slow. Uh, especially when you're trying to you know, ping millions of addresses that could be inside of a slash 16. Uh, and so what I did is I wrote this, wrote this tool here called Scan Cannon. Uh, and it's, here's the code. You can just go ahead and, and screenshot this and then type this out yourself at home like we used to do in the 90s. Who remembers that on the, com the, the computer magazines in the 90s when you get, there'd be a game that, and they'd just print the code inside the magazine and you'd go to the library and have to type all this code out. And then you always make a typo and then your game doesn't work and you're, and they're wondering, wow, this, kid's, this kid really likes the library. He's been here for eight hours. Uh, don't do that. This, 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 code, this code's all up on my GitHub. You can go grab it from there um, using the links that are at the beginning end of this deck. So don't worry about that. But the, way, the, the gist of how Scan Cannon works is it uses uh, a, 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 an Nmap-like utility called MassScan, which, is a, which was built to literally scan the entirety of the internet. Uh, and it uses mass scan to just find out which IPs in that slash 16 are hosting something or hold it, hosting some kind of server. Just figures out what's up. And that really narrows our space down. And so then once we have way, way, way less IPs, then we fire up our end map and we start scanning those. And we're not scanning, um, we're not looking for everything that's on those IPs. We're not looking for every last possible service that's listening on those IPs. We're looking for very specific services, which again, really makes Nmap way faster. You don't scan for port one through 65535. That's gonna take you years. You're scanning for just a tiny handful of very specific ports. What are those ports? Those ports are for services that are running anything that hosts any kind of system that authenticates against Active Directory. You know, we're looking for Outlook web access. We're looking for remote desktop. We're looking for VPN uh, logins. A lot, of, a lot of systems still use like web-based VPN gateways, or they don't, they don't know that they have a web-based VPN gateway set up because uh, they, they just stood up the VPN and we're like, all right, cool, it's ready to go. During the pandemic, these, you know, these increased exponentially. There is so many poorly set up VPNs on the internet uh, out there. It's absolutely insane. Just looking at the numbers here, I see uh, 5.3. This, this, so this tool I used here was um, Shodan just to get these numbers up. Um, I, I'm looking at, this was about a month ago, 5.3 million uh, Outlook web access. Um, 4.8 million remote desktops. This is, this is remote desktop. This is a computer hosting remote desktop facing the internet, like asking you to log in to this computer and it's just out there on the internet. Um, that's When I first did this in 2017, that number was 1.7 million. We haven't gotten more secure. We have put exponentially more millions of computers directly on their internet soliciting logins. Uh, and so that's that's what we're looking for. We want to authenticate against Active Directory in order to gain better access into this company. Um, moving through here. Uh, and we're going to see why in just a little bit. Um, next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and uh, look for documents that are on the internet that are related to this company. Um, some documents are obviously useful, for example, like I've seen companies uh, publicly host VPN connection instructions, since folks can't get the instructions when they're not on the VPN. That can be super useful for finding things maybe you haven't found already. Maybe there's a little trick to connecting to the VPN. Maybe you gotta use a specific piece of software that's also often freely available. Those instructions are super handy for that, but often you can figure that out if you could just find the VPN. But mostly you're gonna be looking for documents uh, that on the surface, appear to be innocuous. Uh, however, the, the metadata in those documents can prove super useful. It often contains usernames, it contains email addresses, it contains machine names, sometimes even IP addresses internally that can be leveraged later when we're attempting in, uh, infiltration uh, and lateral movement. So uh, companies will often, you know, just intentionally host various PDFs and things like that off of their website without scrubbing the metadata out of there. And that metadata uh, is what's going to end up going into our notes, stuff that might be useful later, might not. Um, but this is, uh, this is super, super useful. I've got a few tools here I use for that. I like FOCA because it's got a very nice graphical user interface, or uh, evil FOCA, it's called. Um, Recon NG and the Harvester are like the de facto tools we use for doing this as well. Um, and in the end, what we're doing is we're scraping metadata out of documents. Um, but to log into these Active Directory systems that we found, we still need usernames. We still need passwords. 
So let's go figure out what some usernames are going to be. Um, I really like using Hunter IO for this. Uh, it's a because it's really easy to scrape their website without um, having to like register. You just I won't get into that, but <laughs> Hunter.io is really good for this. You can hunt down a ton of email addresses. Um, this also gives you the format of the email address. This gives you email addresses you can use for phishing. Um, if you have, if you were able to gather usernames from the documents that we mentioned earlier uh, through here, and then we compare those usernames and that nomenclature, that naming convention they use, to the email addresses we can get from here. Oftentimes, that means if we don't have usernames for all of these email addresses are found, if they use naming conventions that are relatively obvious, like first name, last initial, and the username, and that's also what the email address looks like, or if the, the username is first name, last initial, but the email address is first name dot last name, we can easily glean and create usernames for this company based on email addresses that we can find out there. <clears throat> uh, and then once again, don't forget about Aaron being a great place to hunt down really, really important email addresses for either phishing or just understanding how those email addresses are laid out and create in case you need to create more on your own. So now we've, uh, through this recon, we've discovered uh, a ton of places where we can log into an organization. We know their entire IP space. Um, you can try running a Vuln scan against that if you want. That's extremely noisy. I don't recommend it if you're trying to stay hidden. Uh, and now we've also done a great job of probably gleaning a ton of usernames that are going to be useful. Um, and I, man, I can't overstate this enough. Like Hunter.io is a great place for this. But if you're also looking for just, if you can get just names of people who work on an organization, LinkedIn is a great place for this. Salesforce, data.com, all great places, like totally legitimate services that tell you where pe who works at a place, we're using them to, to create log, uh, logins and hack this company. So how do you defend against this? Um, a lot of your edge monitoring, if you set this up right, is gonna prevent against any kind of like high speed end mapping, um, firewall walking, anything like that. Um, find it first, know what you have facing the internet, know uh, where you're, what is, what is soliciting logins, especially logins that hit Active Directory. You'll notice like I didn't, I'm not talking about application security here, uh, here a lot and attacking applications. It is because generally hosted applications like that aren't authenticating against Active Directory. It's usually customer logins and that's not something we care about here. Um, look for your assets out there, run these tools. Every one of these defense slides is gonna say, run these tools, do it yourself. Find it, fix it, write alerts for what you can't clean. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm moving through this real fast. We don't have a ton of time, so uh, feel free to ask me questions later for sure. Uh, moving now, now we've got all that. We have to exploit this. We have to get in. We have perhaps enough to exploit. We have to find a way in. What are we doing? We've got a, we've got a place to log in. We have several places that we can attempt to log in. We have a ton of usernames. Um, what are we missing here? We're missing our passwords. We need passwords. Well, it turns out we're not really using passwords. Um, we can all really easily guess what a lot of those passwords probably are. I'm, in fact, I'm going to put on, I'm going to put up the most common passwords you'll ever find in any environment right here. Um, we all know these. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, you know, and we're laughing at this and we're laughing that it's funny because it's true laugh. Um, this is especially, so, you know, what do we, what do we see on the left, on the left side here? It's all, it's all uh, uh, seasons, right? Spring, summer, fall. What, why, why is that so common? Why do we keep seeing this? Uh, it's because these companies for ages have said, oh, you got to rotate your, your password every 90 days. They do this ridiculous, unnecessary rotate your password every 90 days thing. And what happens every 90 days? Oh, the seasons change. So when you're forcing people to think of new passwords every 90 days, they're going to run out and they're just going to start doing dumb crap like this, this like season year. Also, this is like the de facto standard for what help desks use for companies which exist and a plethora of them exist today that still do this, where you call in to get your password reset or you email a password reset system or someone in IT does this and it just resets it to this default and this changes every 90 days and then the user never changes it to anything else and that's just where it stays. Um, password, capital P, throw a one at the end, you know, tell people like, oh, you gotta have, also have a number and, and a symbol in your password and that'll make it secure. No, because they're just gonna put a one and an exclamation point at the end. That's what everyone does. 
Uh, at the very least, they definitely throw the exclamation point at the end. Um, if I know like a company's password standard, I'm gonna like I don't even try other symbols. I just put the password at the end. Like and so when you're when you're when you're trying to brute force passwords, like that's that's the key. Reduce that key space. Also, the stuff on the right, this like F company name. This works so often. This like people think they're cute. Like oh, I'm gonna stick it, stick it to this company. I'll make my password like F this place. You're you're definitely sticking it to the place because I'm exploiting this for sure. This one I gotta give it up to Chris Nickerson for tipping me off on that one. This has been a gold mine. Everyone does this. Everyone thinks they're cute. F company name. Throw a one and an exclamation point at the end. You're gonna get a lot of a lot of passwords that way. Uh, another thing I like to use is um, this this tool called Cuel C E W L. Um, this uh, scrapes keywords off of company websites. And that's really useful because oftentimes people are going to make their passwords, especially for service accounts, they're going to make the password be something that the company does. You know, something, some value that the company has, something the company cares about. And Q will, will scrape keywords, look for the ones that are most common, give you a nice list, and you'll be like, all right, let me take these words, throw a one at the end, throw an exclamation point at the end, maybe throw a 2021 on the end, and you're going to get in. Like, this is a, this is a practically guaranteed list of, of passwords they're going to use. Uh, and the lar larger the organization, the better. So how do we start trying all these? Um, Burp, Burp Suite used to be like the de facto tool for this. I will note that the, um, the, the, the public version, the community version of this, no longer does password brute forcing. That's only in the paid version now. Um, but that aside, um, whatever, depending on whatever you're trying to attack, there are lots of tools out there that uh, will, will do this for you. Um, there's Hydra, which is really good for remote desktop. Um, Ike Force is a really good tool if you're trying to attack VPNs. Um, Metasploit has a brute forcer for every service under the sun, although it tends to be a bit slow compared to everything else. Um, and so that's how that goes. Another great way of testing all your logins is Mail Sniper. <clears throat> And Mail Sniper, you remember, was real famous. It came out a few years ago. Uh, its big thing was that it exploited enterprise uh, or uh, exchange web services, EWS. And a lot of companies didn't even realize they were running EWS on their edge uh, because it's something that's that's just automatically stood up. Um, also, a lot of mail clients require EWS for them to connect. Um, that that Mac, Mac OS Mail needs EWS to be running on your edge for it to connect. It can't just use the general Outlook services uh, or the general exchange uh, the, the, the standard methods without getting into how exchange works. Um, and so Mail Sniper would, would exploit uh, being able to brute, brute, brute force things at the EWS side. And a really, 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 really cool part about EWS is that Microsoft never implemented F MFA on EWS. So even if you have MFA on your, you know, uh, your web page, your, your webmail login, it doesn't exist in EWS. So now we have a great way of just bypassing MFA right here, if, if they happen to be you know, having it there. So that allows us to definitely get a lot more usernames uh, and test for a lot more passwords in here. Uh, and also, this works against Office 365. I threw a little note there on the bottom uh, to, to a site that actually can walk you through how to use Mail Sniper against Office 365. So like to date, we are still not safe against this. Uh, this also lets you um, use just email addresses if you don't know anyone's uh, usernames. Uh, so another great way, if you just weren't able to figure out a username nomenclature or get a good list, you can just use the email addresses you scrape from around the internet from every dump that's ever existed because Exchange will let you use an email address as a valid username for every AD user account. Uh, and then once you're in, it also lets you start scraping these mailboxes right from the command line and start looking for keywords, you know, looking for things like password, things like that. So super Super freaking useful. Uh, and then, like, finally, you can always just fish your way in. Um, I, love, I love this, like, stock photo I used at the top because that's not supposed to be the user. That's me going, how do they fall for this crap? Um, I, I have gotten in trouble for the phishing campaigns that I used to design for a company I used to work for because they were devastatingly effective and freaked out too many people inside, and HR had a nightmare cleaning up the messes that I would made that I would make um, because I would do things like, hey, new benefits information. You know, un unfortunately, we're no longer able to cover children as part of our medical health care plan. Please click here to find out more information. <laughs> everyone clicks on that. Yeah, like, oh, new bonus structure. Click here to see, to, to see everyone's bonuses. Or, yeah, like, if you hit, hit, them, hit them where they have the most passions, their wallet, 
their children, uh, you know, their health, things like that. Everyone, everyone will click on that. Like, I don't know why we have this dumb crap coming out that's like, oh, here's the itinerary for the upcoming meeting. Please click here. Nobody's clicking on that. No. <laughs> Tell them their kids aren't going to have health care anymore. Watch what happens then. It's absolutely insane. Um, so, yeah, I, fishing, I, as a penetration tester, I often had clients who were like, don't, no fishing. Fishing's out of scope. You're not allowed to fish. Why is fishing out of scope when it's so common? It's because they know it works. It's useless to them in the report when you go, we just fished everybody. They're like, we know. Do something else, please. We, spent, we gave you a lot of money. Tell us something we didn't already know. Um, when you're fishing, you also don't want to, like, blast the same email to all 17,000 employees at a company. Um, you want to try to target who you can. You want to try to figure out who works where, who works in IT, especially who works in the help desk. Why do we target help desk people when they're often the least knowledgeable of all, knowledgeable of all IT? It's because they're often the least knowledgeable of all IT, and we often give them the keys to the freaking kingdom. Hit them. They're going to click on stuff, and if you land on a help desk computer, you are all set. So, uh, also... I know I said we don't exploit a lot of vulnerabilities. There's a few, and, and we don't exploit a lot of vulnerabilities because they cause a lot of problems. They often cause systems to crash. They're making computers do things they weren't supposed to do, and that can have a lot of un undesirable results. They often don't work every time. Uh, sometimes they don't work at all. And uh, if you're not running a vuln scanner, you also not, aren't even sure if something's vulnerable against it. But what I like to do is take a look at uh, CISA's. This is CISA. CISA's top 10 vulnerabilities for right now. And uh, the in top 10 vulnerabilities that are actively being exploited in the wild. And what does that mean? That means that there are exploits out there. It also means because they're being active, actively exploited, they're very useful. They're often going to do something like get you a shell or get you access to a specific system. And that's why they're being blasted out like this. Now, I, I want to call out again, this is for this year. For those of you who know how CVE nomenclature works, what's the four digits in the middle? Those are years. I see a 2015 in there. I see a 2012. We have a vulnerability from 2012 in the top 10 actively exploited vulnerabilities on the internet right now. So don't think like just because there's a patch out there that, you know, it's, it's not going to work. Um, nobody's patching. Definitely look into these and try these. So how do we defend against this? Um, have good security awareness training. Good security awareness training changes the mentality of your employees. It's not just the boring crap that they have to use all the time. Good security awareness training trains your employees to be secure in their own personal lives, how to secure the, their equipment, how to secure their personal information, because that's what they care about. Why does phishing work so well? Because these people don't care about the company. They don't care about the company's information. They don't care about getting their CEO rich. Uh, it's not their stuff. They're just not vigilant. But if you train them to be secure in their own lives, they're going to bring that vigilance inherently to work just accidentally. Um, positive reinforcement for reporting security flaws and phishing attempts goes an immense amount of way. There's no end of white papers on that. Um, and then make sure that there's that HR uh, follows up on violations of acceptable use policies. You know, if people are using their personal, their, their work laptops, and this is, this is such a massive problem during the pandemic now, because we've given everyone a work laptop to take home. Um, lots of people have sold their personal laptops because work gave them a better one. And then they go, hey, man, I got, a, I got an awesome laptop here. Sell that, keep that money, and I'll just use my work laptop for everything. And that's what they're doing. And they're, surf they're surfing the dirtiest filthiest websites on the internet with their work laptop and nothing nothing is being done about this hr is afraid to enforce anything make sure that there is like what what is what is a security policy without enforcement what what is that it's a i don't know why you have to enforce this you have to start putting your foot down and making sure that there's retribution for violating a policy this, this, this frustrates me a lot, and I'm sure that's very obvious. <laughs> and it's because companies go, well, they're not, you know, they're not using the, la the work laptops for personal purposes because that's against their policy, so we know that that's not a thing we have to issue. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let's, I mean, let's talk about gun laws. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, defending against specifically the brute forcing, the password guessing, um, MFA. MFA, holy crap. MFA is absolutely devastating. If I come across a login with MFA, no, I just leave. I try. I have to try a different tactic. I have to go somewhere else. It's it's absolutely freaking devastating. It's no. It's it's not worth trying. Um, the problem is, and we all know that. You know, MFA is not a new thing. MFA, we've all, literally every person on earth with a phone uses MFA because their bank requires them to have it. So why am I even like bringing this up? So many companies don't implement MFA everywhere and that's the problem especially internally i love getting into a company perhaps by fishing getting a shell getting in internally and seeing oh the intranet all of these intranet sites don't require mfa now i'm just brute forcing i'm pat password guessing in your network because you didn't put mfa on the intranet sites you could what is it another eight dollars a year like why aren't you people doing this um, you, you can do other things like you can start doing rate limiting and locking down query types um, in, in EWS and other things, but that, that starts to break things. So be super careful with that. Um, I always recommend alerting over actual throttling just for the sake of not breaking anything. But um, make sure that when you're setting up alerts, as we all know, you tweak them. You monitor, you tweak, you monitor, tweak, because otherwise, we, I mean, we've all been there. As blue teamers, you're inundated with alerts all the time. Everything's a false positive. Every time you see an alert come in, you don't care because it's probably a false positive. Yeah, you might go look into it, but you might, might not look into it, you know, immediately. Uh, and that may be when I'm doing my work and breaking into your company. Uh, and so you have to, if, if you run a SOC, if you run a security team that does engineering for, for specifically for like, uh, alerting within your SEM, make sure that you're building in time and budget for people to constantly be tweaking the alerts that are in there. Certainly don't just be blindly using the alerts that come out of the box. Sure, try them out, but tweak them because otherwise you're going to get just that alert fatigue. Your SOC team isn't going to care anymore. Nothing's going to get responded to fast enough. And then by the time they figure out something bad has happened, I've already gotten the golden run. <clears throat> Um, specifically talking about password bias and password reuse here. Um, awareness training surrounding proper password creation is, whole, uh, is, is huge. Um, I always tell people, use a whole sentence. Um, Gosh, I love working here. Exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> great password. Great password even without the exclamation point. Why? Spaces. Spaces. Spaces are devastating, to, especially to password crackers. Nobody, nobody puts spaces uh, and this is this is password cracker secret. Nobody thinks to put pa put spaces in all the list of characters that they're trying to crack against. Um, don't use patterns. Uh, don't use username as a username as the password. Like this is this should be obvious. Make it greater than fourteen characters. Um, even today in 21, 2021, 14 characters plus. Just even with NTLM takes for freaking ever to crack. Um, and in Enforce this. Make sure that you're, you're auditing this and enforcing it. Um, and you can do this by just looking at the hashes. You know, dump, dump your hive from your domain controller and start cracking stuff internally uh, and, and, and look for bad passwords that way. That aside, you can just compare hashes to check for dupes. You know, look for duplicate passwords on accounts and then figure out why, why do we have this same password on all these service accounts. That's, I love that. Like a company that uses the same password for all of its service accounts, real common, real useful for me. Um, and then, it's, of course, use MFA. And I have been a huge promoter of this last one forever and ever, and I, get, and I get a lot of crap for it. Stop using passwords. If you can stop using passwords in your environment, um, that's, that's amazing. And, and, and you go, well, how do you, what, what do you mean? Just <laughs> That sounds like don't authenticate, and that's not what we want to do. No, um, use at some other means of providing an authentication token to a user that doesn't involve a password. Most often, and we see this all the time in, uh, in, a, lot of the, in a lot of mobile apps uh, or um, banking apps, uh, medical healthcare apps do this, where you click to log in and it sends you an email with a link or it sends a text to your phone with a link. That's MFA. You, you, you need your username, you need to have your phone, 
And then if you can add an MFA co code on top of that, that's insanely secure. There's no way you can brute force that because you need to possess so many things that only exist in one instance. Now, I realize that's difficult to implement and it expects a lot of things out of the users, but um, that's amazing. Getting rid of passwords in their entirety uh, is where we need to be focusing. It's where we should be heading for the future. Passwords suck, especially when you are always relying on humans to make passwords because they will always make passwords that they can remember and anything we can remember is inherently basic. So now we've guessed some passwords. We have a bunch of user accounts. We've gotten into the company. We have, <clears throat> we're able to get in the VPN and we can remote into a user's laptop, a user's desktop that's sitting out there. Um, what do we do now? Now we've, we've landed on a computer. Generally, it's going to be a Windows computer. You want it to be a Windows computer because that's where you can do the most fun, especially when we're dealing with Active Directory. And our goal here, you know, where are we heading with this? We're trying to, generally, you want to become a domain admin. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get what you're looking for, but if you're a domain admin, unfortunately, it does mean you're going to have access to whatever it is you are looking for, whether that's credit card numbers, whether that's financial information. Um, uh, most companies give their domain admins keys to the kingdom and let them get away with whatever they want because they think that's what a domain admin needs to be able to do, and that's absolutely just not the case. In fact, there's a lot of regulatory systems that ban that, but a lot of companies don't comply with that. And so getting domain admin generally means that you're going to succeed in what you're trying to do. So anyway, first, when we first land on a computer, what do we want to do? Um, we want to get rid of the EDR. That EDR might not get in our way. In fact, probably won't get in our way. But just in case, we got to shut that down. What's my favorite way of, of, of shutting down an EDR? Um, injecting myself into the EDR process and then shutting the process down from inside. Process injection is one of the most basic offensive security tactics out there. There's various ways of doing it. Um, there's plenty of documented ways of doing it for various types of EDRs. Um, it's, it's rare I find an EDR that doesn't have some means of shutting it down once you're on the computer, especially with the fact that nearly everyone, every company out there allows the user of the computer to have local administrative rights on that computer because we don't have the guts to tell people they don't need it and to knock it off. And so if I'm on a computer and I have valid user credentials, I'm probably a local admin. I can probably at the very worst use the backend API to just ask, ask the EDR to turn itself off and it's going to go, cool, you're the admin, bro. You got it. Now there's no EDR in the, the system or process injection because oftentimes I'm only getting a shell. It's super easy. You guys, you know, I can't, there's no, the process injection is an entire half hour talk on its own. It's not the hardest thing to do. You guys can look that up. But now, good, we've shut down the EDR. Let's move forward. Um, now, what I like to do is use this tool called Responder. Responder has been out for ages and it keeps getting updated every time Microsoft fixes something that, uh, that makes it not work so well. Um, the, the, the one person who works on Responder uh, like within a month has a fix for that and also adds six more features to it that are equally devastating. Responder, probably my favorite tool out of every offensive security tool that's out there. What it does is it sits and it passively listens for all the network traffic that comes through uh, and, and looks for computers that can't find the, uh, the IP address for a host name that they're looking for. And this happens if like the DNS just isn't responding in time, if they have a bad DNS configuration, there's just something wrong with DNS on their end. Um, and it, this happens way, way, way more often than you might think, even in a large enterprise with like tertiary DNSs. Um, these computers will say, hey, I'm looking for this host, th this server. And they're usually looking for servers, looking for SMB shares, they're looking for some kind of network resource they need to connect to. Re Responder goes, oh, that's me. Uh, you, can, you can get there through me. But Responder goes, I don't trust you though, so you better authenticate. Give me your password so I know that you're you and then I'll let you in. And the computer goes, yeah, that's how things work. So here are my credentials. And this all happens on the back end. The user doesn't see this happen ever. This all happens on the back end. Um, and it will pass you, it does pass you uh, an NTLM hash that you do have to crack. And you go, okay, well, all right, now we're into password cracking. Um, that, you know, nobody's bringing uh, a password cracking rig with six GPUs. Uh, on site. Certainly, like, it's rare to find a penetration, co penetration testing company that's going to let you spend the budget on a six GPU uh, password cracking rig in 2021 when a single old crappy GPU right now will cost you $600. But you don't need it. Why do you not need that? 
for all the reasons we just talked about, password bias. Users create crappy passwords. So if you can create a good rule set for that password cracking, you can do that all locally. You get a nice word list, you get a nice rule set uh, that, that says here's how humans are gonna create the passwords. Um, you can talk to AD once you're on the computer and figure out what the local password policy is, really get that key space down, uh, and you're gonna be able to crack that locally if you want. I almost always cracked user passwords on my MacBook Pro that I was using to do all of this. You know, MacBook Pro, low-end GPU, always get a few passwords out of that. And it's often like, oh, I throw the hashes in there, I'm gonna go to lunch, you know, like an hour. Come back, oh, cool, I got a bunch of hits. And in the meantime, Responder is also gathering more stuff. And Responder, you just leave that running. You just leave that thing running. You can leave that running for days and then come back and it will just have tons and tons of hashes. It's nuts how often this goes on, on the back, in the background of your, of your network and you just never see this happening. Um, it also has a lot of tools inside of it that can actively start petitioning things to come and authenticate against it. Um, it's really cool, highly recommend you look into this. It's absolutely devastating for um, getting things that are gonna be really useful for lateral movement later on. Um, you also then want to start exploiting SMB and WMI. These are, these are the core services of how a Windows network communicates uh, with itself at all. Um, uh, RID enum is a really cool, easy tool that's good for um, enumerating active directory usernames. If you still at this point have a really tiny list, maybe you only got like one or two users and they're not very... Uh, high up in the in the organization and they don't have the access that you're looking for. You Once you're in an Active Directory environment, you can use RID Enum to start getting all of the other usernames. And then you could start trying to like go back to our password list and start guessing all those passwords. You're gonna get 10 more out of there. And you could start looking at who these people are. You're on a computer now. You can look in Active Directory and see who that person is just by looking at their title inside of Active Directory. We're using Windows tools here. And it's like, how do you alert on that? Are you gonna alert on every time somebody like looks up a user in Active Directory? No, that's a standard thing users do like a thousand times a day. So we're, we're doing something that just looks normal and we're using the user's credentials to do it. I have a valid username, I have a valid password. I'm doing something normal. You can't spot this, you can't alert on this because it's just normal everyday stuff. And this is how we operate. Um, a really good tool here, uh, Crack Map Exec. Did I cover that up? Oh no, there you go. Um, crack Mac exec, you may have heard this referred to as just CME. Um, this is what I, I throw up at this point. Once I got a few hashes from and, and a few passwords from uh, password cracking, I'll open this up. But you don't even need credentials to run Crack Map exec because it also exploits null sessions, sessions that don't require any kind of credentials to access information around the environment. And um, it's real easy to accidentally leave null sessions available for various uh, network resources. This is super common. People don't know to look for it. There's certain scenarios where it's the default. And so I can hit a lot of stuff and do a lot of weird things, uh, including see who's logged in on other computers, which can go a long way towards figuring out where I want to go next to, to, to grab somebody's stuff. Crack Magnusf is awesome for that. It's super awesome if you have credentials because then that allows you to start stealing other people's hashes, stealing other people's um, session tokens for their login sessions on the machines they're on, which is great because then that means I can immediately just go present that token and log into that machine they're on or other machines where that, that log, they may have login sessions where that token is valid. Um, that is stupid useful because we're, we're making our way around. We're trying to figure out how to get domain admin. Shit, if I can, if I can migrate into a domain controller, that's an amazing time. Um, but that's often, that, that's some, that, that, that often at least is locked down, but we'll talk about how to deal with that in just a second. Um, and, and also like, uh, oh yeah, nobody, nobody monitors um, WMI either. So like crack map exec can use SMB or WMI. Um, no, like lots of people monitor and alert on odd SMB activity. Nobody, nobody monitors and alerts on WMI. I think they just forget it exists or don't realize how powerful it is and how it's an SMB alternative. So pro tip there. <clears throat> that all that aside, Mimic Cats. I think by now everyone knows what Mimic Cats is. If you don't, it is uh, a tool that allows you to scrape useful things out of the memory on a system. Um, every EDR out there will catch and stop Mimic Cats, except that it's really easy to run Mimic Cats and a lot of tools directly from RAM. Uh, on the system. And so that's, that's another way, I, maybe I should have talked about this when we talk about EDR bypass, but um, that's another way that we get around that EDR is a lot of the EDRs aren't pulling the contents of memory 
fast enough to catch you if you try to do something wacky that's only in RAM. So if I do need to download a tool and run it on a computer, I will never write it to the disk. I will never download it directly to the disk and then execute it from there. You're absolutely going to get caught, especially if it's a real common tool like Mimikins. Download it, you know, open up a PowerShell prompt. You're going to have local admin because that's just the way things work. Um, and then download it right into memory, execute it in memory. There's ways to do this. It's very easy. Uh, and now you have the EDR is watching the disk going, well, we're going to make sure nobody gets in here. And they're not looking at the RAM at all. And you're in RAM literally stealing passwords. Um, depending on the version of Windows and, and, and patch levels and how things are configured in here, um, you can dump clear text passwords out of computers. Uh, and you go, oh, well, they stopped allowing that in Windows 10. Um, oh, there's a lot of things, a lot of changes in modern operating systems that enterprises have to do in order for them to be backwards compatible with a lot of the older stuff that they're still running in their environments. Uh, and a lot of that involves disabling a lot of the newer security measures that protect against these tools. And so again, if the larger the enterprise that you're attacking, the more success you're going to have. And you would think that it would be the other way around, like, oh, a huge company, they're going to be locked down as shit. No, there's too much stuff. They can't keep an eye on everything. And there's too much stuff that has to talk to too much other stuff. And so they just have to allow a lot of the stuff to exist. So Mimikatz lets you um, scrape passwords from RAM. At the very worst, it's going to let you um, scrape out more hashes that you can pass back into crack, crack map exec, keep rolling, seeing what else, what else you could find. Um, but like, we're kind of stuck in this loop where like, we're looking for hashes, we're looking for passwords, and then we're just like looking at what other computers we can get into. Um, we, don't, we don't exactly know where we're, where we're going. We don't know the lay of the land. We don't know what this network looks like. Um, sure, we can start spending hours and hours and days making a network map and running Nmap on everything and making a crap ton of noise that way and probably get caught and probably get shut down. Um, or we can use this tool called Bloodhound. Bloodhound is devastatingly good. Bloodhound is really cool because it leverages requests that computers normally make to domain controllers and other computers. So it's not doing, it's again, it's not doing anything weird. Um, what it does is it, uh, it pulls Active Directory and machines in the environment and says, who's logged in where? And it gets those names and it goes, what user groups do those people belong to? And it gives you this ni nice little map here that shows you if, you know, I know it's hard to see on the screen, but it shows you like, this person's logged into here. This person is a member of this group. Anyone in this group is allowed to authenticate against these other machines. These, and eventually you go through and you look through and what you're looking for is like, you're trying to find a domain admin that you want to exploit. You want to find a domain admin that's logged in somewhere. And there's always a domain admin logged in somewhere. I don't know why. It, like the only time you should need to use a domain admin account is when you are modifying a domain controller and that is almost never. But I find this all the time. These people using their domain admin accounts to get elevated privileges to change something when they just should have a different account, not the domain admin account. And then, you know, they're doing, they, get, they got paged out at five o'clock. They're about to leave. Uh, they got to fix something. They just use the domain admin account instead of trying to look for the account that has the privileges that they need in order to access this system. Or like their base admin account doesn't let them get into the system because somebody pushed the wrong GPO rules to that one. So they got to use a domain admin account. And they log in there and they fix something. And then it's like, it's 6.30 p.m. and they're tired and they just leave and they accidentally leave that session logged in. I would find this all the time. I find way more domain admins logged in after business hours than during, for sure. So, yeah, another great point there. Do this, um, do some of this at both times of day. You want during business hours because that's when the most users, that's when there's the most network traffic. That's when there's the most stuff that your responder is going to catch. That's when the most stuff that your CME is going to be able to utilize. That's when you have the most users logged in. But also, like, when you're trying to target domain admins, do stuff after hours. I don't know why, but that scenario I gave you, I think, is exactly what's happening. And a lot of them end up being logged in. And so what Bloodhound gives you is this, this path that you can then trace. You go, all right, where are the domain admins? Where am I? What is the shortest path of go into this machine, steal these session tokens, then use that session token to go into this machine, steal the session tokens, and then go into this machine that I can get into now that has a domain admin logged in, steal that domain admin session token, use, use that token to then authenticate against a domain controller, make yourself a domain admin account, uh, don't rely on being able to always use this one you just stole because that's not going to happen. 
you often, you know, for, I mean, of course, first thing you want to try is like, can I get a clear text password for this domain admin? Because that's going to be super useful. And often Mimic Cats is going to give you that. But uh, long story short, use this to then get to a domain controller. Make yourself a domain admin account, and that's going to open a ton of doors for you. That's going to let you have essentially free reign of this network. And nobody's going to know that you're up to anything because you are not even running tools anymore. You are just a domain admin successfully authenticating against things, which, which is fine. Uh, here's some other screenshots of what this looks like. This one on the bottom is, is actually a company that I had used it against. All of the red boxes there are machines that where the user that's logged in has local admin. Uh, and that's a ton of red machines, and that's real common. Companies love giving local admin to people, and if I have local admin in a box, I can do all of the things that I just discussed really easily, really quietly, uh, not a problem. Uh, there's also this tool called uh, Empire, uh, PowerShell Empire, although it's, it's also written in C now. Um, this is a, another way of exploiting a lot of the things that I have just discussed. Um, it's really great if all you can get is a shell on a Windows machine. You can fire up this uh, and start going nuts. And again, do the same thing that I did before and, and eventually work your way to having a domain admin token in your hands. Um, there's also Death Star itself is an automator for PowerShell Empire. This thing is so good that if you can get local admin on a machine, run this, run Death Star, you just tell it to go and you go, you go get a sandwich. Every you know, half hour, you stick your head in the room, you make sure it's still running. And with surprising success rates, you're going to come back and it's going to be like, hey, you're a domain admin. Congrats. Uh, in fact, that's, this is exactly what the output of that one looks like. Uh, and you're going to go, oh, cool. I literally like, just got a shell on a machine, ran this, actually got a sandwich, and now I'm a domain admin in this environment because it exploits all of the things that I just talked about that are super common in these environments. Um, but uh, before, you know, in case you don't want to do that or that's not working, my favorite attack of the day, this is like my favorite 2021 thing going on right now, is um, they, they call it uh, certified pre-owned. <laughs> and it, it ex uh, uses this petite podium um, exploit that is super effective. This, this entire process, and you'll have to, uh, I, I put a link at the end of the slide that has all these tools and a link to exactly how this attack chain works. Um, this exploits something that was discovered in Windows certificate services. That it, it, It's heavily exploiting, like I said at the beginning, poor configurations. It's not exploiting uh, necessarily something that is wrong in in the code for Microsoft certificate services or anything like that. It's exploiting the fact that most organizations and most system means in those organizations don't know how to do Microsoft certificate services and certificate distribution properly. Uh, and that is, that is a rampant issue all the way across the board in every, every enterprise uh, because it hasn't, it hasn't been exploitable in the past or nobody had discovered that it was exploitable in the past, and everything works. You know, they got certificate services working, they got certificates on all their machines, they think they're defending against all of these like kinds of attacks because, oh, we got certificate verification now. Um, uh, first off, if I'm using a valid machine in your network, I, the certificates aren't super useful because it's always gonna comply. Um, but because everything works, they don't think that there's any security flaws involved in what they're doing, and the, this, the, the fine, there's a great white paper on this that shows that like, Nobody is doing certificates right, and this can exploit the crap out of this. So this is, this is this process, and I won't dig deep into it. Is really bad. Um, the solution is go look this up and fix fix all. You know, Microsoft's got papers on this. Fix the security, this, the certificate services that are going on uh, inside of your environment to make sure that you're not susceptible to that. But uh, if you are, which if the if if this person we're attacking is, uh, which they are, again. Long story short, we're going to be, be going to be able to get a domain admin uh, password or you know Kerberos ticket, something like that. That's going to allow us to do some terrible things, including make ourselves our own domain admin account with a password that we know, and that oh man, that makes things so much easier. And so at that point, like we're still in post, you know, we're we're back to post exploitation. Cool, I've exploited something. I got a domain admin password. So what? Well, then you try to figure, you try to find where the gold is at. You know, is it credit card numbers? What, what are you trying to do? What is your goal? Is your goal maybe to install ransomware? Um, now you've got a domain admin account and you've got some ransomware that you need to install in the environment. How many computers are you going to be able to install ransomware with with a freaking domain admin account? The entirety of them. All of them. Yeah, and you're not doing this by hand. You write a little script that you use, you use uh, 
you know, whatever, whatever means of software distribution that IT is using to install things in every computer, you just use that. And you just spam this stuff out. And it is really easy to buy ransomware that uh, ADRs won't, won't catch because the signatures aren't known. It is, that is, this is probably the easiest and least scammed thing on the dark web to buy. Custom ransomware. And yeah, it's the, it's the same ransom, you know, it's mostly the same ransomware that you see everywhere, but it's repackaged in such a way as that, that the EDRs aren't going to catch it until after it's like done its thing. Uh, and so like that's, don't rely on your EDRs to protect against ransomware. Have security in depth. Make sure if somebody does what I'm doing, you have something else in, play that's gonna, in place that's gonna stop this from being able to happen. <clears throat> so again, for, dis, for uh, defending against responder, um, you wanna disable all of these things, <laughs> which can be problematic because especially in, in environments where you're dealing with um, backwards compatibility, some of this stuff is necessary. But this is exactly what it's exploiting. Uh, make sure that your your DNSs are always responding very quickly, because uh, you like it, it. It it exploits a race condition in DNS. SMB signing will stop a lot of these attempts uh, because we the SMB responses that responder provi provides won't be for signed SMB communications. And then if your computers know to look for si you know signed SMB, they're going to go. All right, well that's that's not going to work here. Um, CME, don't use null sessions. And you can find these null sessions by running these tools. Run these tools in environments. See where you have null sessions everywhere and just shut those down. Say no, you should, uh, everything. All of this should require some kind of active directory authentication to access, even if you think that it's, it, you know, it should be public information, it's not a big deal. You should never have null sessions in place anywhere inside of your environment. Um, you can alert again on mass connections like if you see uh, uh, one, one machine making a ton of SMB connections, and you can do this in Microsoft Defender now. Uh, if you see a ton of machines making connections to all kinds of SMB shares all across the network, or you know, one machine doing a lot of this, that's weird. No user is going to do this. One user is going to connect to like maybe you know three SMB shares in a day. Uh, if you see one polling just going through making SMB calls everywhere, flag that. That's, a night, that's not something that should be happening. Uh, and you know, in a best case scenario, that's a bad script somebody wrote. Worst case, it's me. Definitely flag that. Um, flag on, this is a great one. Alert on mass logins. If you see one user logging in all over the place, even though they are successful logins, nobody alerts on successful logins. We think that that's normal. Well, it's successful login, that's good. So they have a username and a password. That's going to be someone who works here and everything's fine. No, it's me. That's like our whole goal as a, as a hacker is to become an employee of your company. Now I've done that by way of just having a username and password. And so you're going to go, that, well, that person works here. And I go, yeah, you're right. I work here. Don't worry about me. Uh, but if I'm logging into a ton of machines in order to like see what's going on in your network, flag on that. Alert. Send out a critical alert. A critical, like somebody gets a phone call alert every single time you see a successful domain admin login. Nobody alerts on successful domain admin logins. And that's ridiculous. And, it's be, and, and you go, well, wow, that's going to be a lot of alerts sending out every day. Yeah, fix that problem. <laughs> People shouldn't be using these domain admin accounts to just screw around on the network. They should have other accounts for that. Domain admin accounts should only be used for modifying domain controllers and nothing else. So, so like, even if you see one log in to a domain controller, critical alert on that. In fact, you might want to say you need a change ticket. You should have a change ticket if you're modifying a domain controller. Absolutely. And so you get a critical alert. Whoever gets that alert can quickly check. Oh, yep, there's a change in place. Or really, in a perfect world, they would already know that there was a change in place and be expecting that alert at this predefined time and go, yep, okay. And they can still send a message over to Frank. Go, hey, Frank, is this, in fact, you logging in? And Frank goes, yep, it's me. Per that change ticket. And you go, cool, everything's fine. Real easy. So set that alert up. Alert on all, all successful domain, domain admin logins anywhere in your environment and make sure that that is a good thing to be doing by making sure people aren't using their domain admin accounts to do dumb crap that don't need it. Uh, and then finally, stop giving everyone and their dog uh, local admin privileges on their machines. Nearly no user in your environment needs this. 
And, you know, they'll try to tell you they do. And they, well, I need it for this and that. Whatever they need it for this and that is, set up granular rules for their account. You can even give them, uh, you know, an elevated privileges account that is still only able to do certain things, and it's not their main account. Make them still, and even the ones where, like, they just, it's better if we just give them blanket local admin on this machine. Still, make it so it's not their daily driver account. Make it so the account that they just do all their daily work on is, is, is not a local admin. I can't abuse that for anything. And if they, the rare once in a while, they need, do need to elevate their, escalate their privileges and do something local admin-y, they do that. They say, run it as administrator, type in their username and password. They do their one thing, and then that's it. That's going to go a huge, huge long way. And I know this takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of conversation, and that's what we're exploiting. We're exploiting the fact that nobody has time to do all of this work. We're exploiting the fact that IT organizations don't want to provide the budget and the headcount to fix all of these things that I'm attacking. It's great. I haven't done anything here yet that is like exploitation of a vulnerability that there's a patch for. Like we, that's, that's kitty crap. That's what the bots do. That's what the scripts out there do. We're not doing that. We're exploiting people who don't have the time to do things properly. Um, for Bloodhound, for like fingerprinting that entire network, run it. Do it yourself. Um, you can alert on anomalous tra traffic volume to a single domain controller because that's what it's going to do. You can set query limits for machines on domain controllers, but that, again, you risk breaking things. Um, Mimic Cats, great fix, man, the, a big killer for Mimic Cats. Uh, that you can program into your EDR. Alert on this lsas.dmp, that's the default file name that it creates when it dumps the file that it then uses to scrape the, the passwords out of. If you see that file ever, ever hit the computer for any reason, because that's not a file that exists outside of this scenario. If you see that, if you see that hit, alert, critical alert, because that is Mimikatz. Somebody in your environment is running Mimikatz, which has no, uh, no noble purpose. <laughs> other than you're doing this to see if it works or something. So definitely critical alert on that one. And again, stop giving everyone local admin. Uh, they're gross buying. I don't know. I can't, I can't hammer this home anymore. You all know about this. <laughs> um, I complained about that too. Cool, I covered all this. Good. So um, that's, that's the end of this attack, attack chain. That's how all this works. I have a, a huge list of all the tools that I mentioned inside of this talk here. Uh, and again, I don't expect you guys to like you know, be memorizing all of this. These slides are available on uh, my GitHub. There's a link down at the bottom. It's, it's the link tree leak that link, link tree link. That'll take you to my link tree. You'll see a little GitHub talks button on there. You can hit that. Um, I've been Johnny Christmas, security researcher at Grimm. Definitely check us out if you need any assessments. Uh, we, do, we, we, are, we do devastating application security assessments as well. If you need engineering to fix the flaws in your software, uh, or if you need any training, we do all of that all the way around, definitely give us a call. Uh, thank you, Greylog, for having me here. This has been super cool. It's super cool doing something live for the first time. Thank you so much. Like, this is amazing. Uh, I, I, I can't appreciate this enough. Thank you. I'll give it to you. <laughs>